Good morning. How many are appreciating the sunshine? Yeah, <laughs> it's all good. And I heard it got almost 70 degrees yesterday. Yeah, see, we're heading in the right direction. Yeah. Uh, some of you might be wondering about communion this morning, and uh, we typically observe uh, coming together to the Lord's table on the first Sunday of the month. We're actually moving that to Good Friday this week, so we would welcome all of you to come and join us on Good Friday. That service is at 6 p.m., and it's a time for us to uh, reflect and to remember the incredible sacrifice that Jesus paid for us. And of course, the next Sunday is Easter Sunday, and we hope you will uh, join us for that as well. We're continuing in Matthew, and we're in chapter 16, and uh, we've, we've crossed the half-year mark on Matthew. Can you believe it? Yeah. And it starts out this way. It says, The Pharisees and the Sadducees came to Jesus and tested him by asking him to show them a sign from heaven. And he replied, when evening comes, you say, it will be fair weather for the sky is red. And in the morning, today it will be stormy for the sky is red and overcast. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. A wicked and adulterous generation looks for a sign, but none will be given it except the sign of Jonah. Then Jesus left them and went away. There's two basic uh, major expressions of Judaism. There's actually three at that time, but the third, the uh, Essenes are, are a little bit less known. But the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And the Pharisees believe in strict adherence to basically two things. One is to the law, and the other is to the oral traditions that have been handed down to them. And so their goal in following those laws is to be able to increase or improve their righteousness. The other group is the Sadducees. They also very much love the law, but for them, they actually don't believe in anything supernatural. They don't believe in angels. They don't really believe in miracles. They don't believe in the resurrection. They believe that the purpose of God's word is not to tell us about supernatural events that happened, but to give us a set of guidelines that we could better live and behave in the world in which we live. And for them, the goal is to obtain as much wealth and political influence as, po as possible so that you can actually make a difference in the world. Because their assumption is the way you make a difference is by gaining political influence. And with the Pharisees, the way you make a difference is by increasing or improving your own self-righteousness by seeking perfection. And neither group with their worldview about how to make a difference in the world accepted Jesus. And by the way, those two groups still exist in Christianity today. There are people who are very much focused on personal righteousness and other people who are very much po focused on increasing resources and, and gaining pol political influence. And, and, and Jesus doesn't sit, fit into their camp, and so they want him to perform a sign. And, and the sign is not to do a bad thing. The, the, the sign is to do something good, something from heaven. And, and the, Jesus... Jesus remembered something when he's listening to them. We want you to prove you are who you say you are by doing something that will convince us. Do you remember when Jesus heard that before? And it's back in his temptations in the wilderness. If you're really the Son of God, if you're really who you say you are, then you should be able to turn stones into bread. Not a bad, bad thing, not breaking the law, not something immoral, unethical, unprofessional, none of those things. But here's, here's the point that we should think about. Temptation often comes when we're trying to gain acceptance or control others' opinions of us. And, and temptation isn't just doing a bad thing. Sometimes there are reasons we do good things, and it's all about trying to control someone else's impressions of us. And Jesus knows that if you start down that road, you wind up becoming someone you were never intended to be. You become a reflection of what other people want instead of living out the life that God has given to you. And so, once again, they're not trying to tempt him to do something bad. 
And what's interesting is that Jesus had been performing miracles. He had been healing people who were sick. He had been setting, uh, bringing freedom to people who were bound. He, he had fed multitudes. Like he was doing all of these things. But, and all of these works are signs, but they're not enough for the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Why is that? Because they wanted a sign based on what was important to them. And as it turns out, taking care of sick people or feeding hungry people or bringing freedom to bound people was not part of their agenda. And so they're, very, they're, they're really struggling with who this Jesus is. And he uses two words to describe their, their mindset, their worldview, the generation that they've kind of been absorbed by. And the two words are wicked and adulterous. Wicked means actually to intend harm and cause pain. You, you actually intend to do harm and cause pain. And secondly, adulterous. You, uh, well, we all understand what adultery is, right? You break your marriage vows because you think that there's something that's better for you. And what he's saying is, is that you're constantly looking for something that's better. So it's an excuse to break the covenants that you've made with God. And he says, the only sign given to you is going to be the sign of Jonah, which they don't understand. It's a riddle to them. And, and, and if you know the story of Jonah, Jonah uh, had been given an assignment by God. He ran away from that assignment. Uh, he wound up on a ship. They were in a horrible storm. Jonah knew that the storm was caused because of his disobedience. He told the other sailors, just throw me over the side and your ship will be saved. They didn't want to do it. They finally had no choice. They throw him over the side. He goes into the storm raging water. He's got swallowed by a giant fish where for three days and nights he was, he was actually being transported to where he was supposed to go to begin with. And I don't know what he looked like when he came out of that situation, but my guess is it would have been Instagram worthy uh, and and so but they don't understand that he's referring to his death burial and resurrection because they don't think about faith in those terms ever and so he, they, he's confused them now this is this is what's interesting it goes on it says uh, when they went across the lake the disciples forgot to take bread be careful, Jesus said to them, be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They discussed this among themselves and said, is it because we didn't bring any bread? Aware of their discussion, Jesus asked, you of little faith, why are you talking among yourselves about having no bread? Do you still not understand? Don't you remember the five loaves and the 5,000? how many baskets you gathered, basketfuls you gathered, or of the seven loaves and the 4,000, and how many basketfuls you gathered? How is it you don't understand I was not talking to you about bread? But be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Then they understood that he was telling them, not, uh, telling them to guard themselves uh, against the yeast uh, used in bread and, and, and against the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees. What, what is he saying here? Well, what were the Sadducees and Pharisees wanting? And what they wanted was proof about Jesus on their terms. They want God on their terms. This is our worldview. God needs to not only fit in with this view, but he needs to perform a sign that we are right. And even though their views were different, they did agree that Jesus needed to do something to substantiate that he was from God. The disciples completely misunderstood Jesus. They thought he was frustrated because they forgot to bring bread. And isn't it often true that, that we assume people get frustrated with us because of something we've forgotten or something that we're lacking or something that we don't have enough of? And, and so they're, they're focused on that. And Jesus says, it's not about that. He, he reminded them of the miracles. How much do I need to, to feed 5,000 or 4,000? That's not what it's about. But what I want you to hear is the idea that you have to, the only way you will believe in God is if he does what you want on your terms and agrees with you. So in that scenario, who's really God? We have to think about that. 
So the, the, the Pharisees, they had this kind of perfectionistic theology, and the Sadducees had a secularistic theology, and, and Jesus challenges both of them. Then it goes on and it says, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? And they replied, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter, if you know anything about Simon Peter, he abhors silence. He just can't stand an awkward moment. And he speaks, uh, he's usually the first one to talk, even if he hasn't thought it through. But this is one of those times when he gets it right. And so we should give him credit for getting it right at least once. And he says, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. Jesus is now going to focus on what makes a church a church. Now, Caesarea Philippi is an interesting place. It hadn't always been called that. Herod the Great had had a few sons, and, and we talked about one of his uh, other sons, Herod the Tetrarch, a couple weeks ago. He had another son that he called Philip, and uh, Philip wanted to be uh, a person who was recognized for making a difference uh, politically in his world. And so he had done some things in this city and he renamed it. And the renaming of the city is Caesarea, which means city of Caesar. And then he added his name to it. So city, city of Caesar, Philip. And part of the reason is because there were other places known as Caesarea and they had names after it. So he wanted to put his name in there so he got all the credit that he deserved. And what's interesting about this place is it's right on the northern border of Israel. Like it, it, is, it is the place that, that you cross traffic from other nations. And the other nations have very different views from the ones in Israel. And so even though there's a lot of Jews that live in Caesarea Philippi, it is also true that there's lots of other people and lots of other influences. In fact, there were temples there that were built to the Syrian god Baal. It was well known as a, one of the major worship centers for Baal and also for the Greek god Pan. In fact, the city's name was Panion. That, that was the name of, of the city before uh, Philip renamed it because they worshiped the Greek god Pan. And Jesus uses this backdrop. Just think about this. He comes to the place where there are all kinds of world religions represented. The god of Baal, the Greek god of Pan, and, and political influence and power. It's actually been named after a political influencer in his world. And that's where he chooses to ask a question, who do people say that I am. And the answers that come back to him are all of important people because I know people who don't like Christianity. They don't trust church. They don't believe the Bible, but I've never heard anybody say a bad word about Jesus. Oh yeah. So he, he said some good things. He was a good person. He did good things. So they always refer to him positively but referring to him positively doesn't mean you understand who he is. And so Jesus turns the question around. Now, this is what's really interesting to me. We're in Matthew chapter 16. Beginning at this moment, Jesus will now start turning towards Jerusalem and head towards his own crucifixion. His ministry has been going on for some time. And this is the first time he's asking the disciples who they think he is. Jesus has been spending a lot of time not talking about himself, but talking about God's kingdom and then showing how God's kingdom can operate in our world by bringing healing to those who are afflicted and bringing freedom to those who are bound and bringing food to those who are hungry. He's, he's giving them information that makes God feel close and people realize how connected God is to them. And so this is what he's doing, but he hasn't been telling them, just remember, this is who I am. He hasn't said that yet. He has not made that claim to them yet. This is really interesting to me because sometimes in church world, we want people on their first initial visit into the house of God to make a declaration about who Jesus is. 
I mean, I grew up in a church where the end of the service usually sounded like this. If you grew up in a church, you might have heard this too, all right? Yeah. If, if you were to die today, if you were to go out and get hit by a bus, I don't know what was taking people out before buses, but once those buses came, man, it has just decimated the population. It's just unbelievable. Do you know for sure that you would go to heaven and that you would know that Jesus Christ is your savior? And, and you probably haven't heard me say that, not because I don't think that that's important, but this is what I believe. I think you're probably going to live today. How many are glad about that? Now watch, somebody's gonna get hit by a bus on the way home. It's just how it works. I think you're probably going to live today, and I think that facing day after day with God is actually better than trying to do day after day on your own. I don't think that God is just good for when we're dead. I think God is good for every single day of our life. Is that a good place to say amen? Yeah. So, uh, so he says, who do you say that I am? And, and they, and Peter speaks up, you are the Messiah, you are the son of the living God. It, it is, you are God's king, you're the ultimate one. You're God's king, you're the ultimate one. And what's happening here is we're seeing that what makes a church a church is focusing on Jesus. It's focusing on Jesus. There's so many things that distinguish and differentiate churches. Uh, style of preachers, and style of music, and style of architecture, and style of liturgy, and, and how many are grateful that we have donuts as part of our liturgy? <laughs> yes, but it's not our donuts, and it's not the name of the person or the style of the person speaking or the style of the music or what songs are being sung or how new they are or how old they are, how a church is laid out. None of that is what makes a church a church. You can find this exact same setup in other venues that have nothing to do with Christianity or faith or God or any of those things. What makes a church a church is that Jesus is the center of it all. You are the ultimate ultimate one. You are the king. And by saying he's king, it's not just saying that we really like you as a person and we think you said good things. When he's the king, he's the one who rules. He's the one who rules. So when I'm facing my own choices in life, ethical choices, moral choices, professional choices, when I'm facing them, it's not just to see how many people I think support what I think is the right thing to do. The thing to do is to figure out what does Jesus want me to do in this situation and then as best I can follow that because he's the ultimate one. He's the king. That's what makes the difference. That's what makes a church a church. And Jesus says, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. This wasn't revealed to you by flesh and blood. Nobody else said this to Peter. Jesus hadn't said this to Peter. How did he know? It was revealed by my Father in heaven. There wasn't a human that told him. God revealed this to Peter. And this is what I think. So I read a lot of commentaries this week. A lot. Because the most talked about passage in the New Testament in commentaries is Matthew 16, upon this rock I will build my church. And there are, if, if you come from a Catholic background, Peter's the rock. And if you come from a Protestant background, it's the confession of Jesus is the rock. And so the question is, who's right? How many would like to know? I actually think it's not either one of those. Now you're all worried. I can see the looks on your faces. I don't think those things are wrong. I can actually make an argument for both of those things. But I think there's something else going on. Jesus says, Peter, you're blessed because nobody told you that but my father. Now listen to this. My father's ability to reveal who I really am is the rock on which I will build this church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. See, 
I can talk to you about Jesus. I can talk to you about scripture. I can talk to you about God. But the truth is, is that belief is a gift from God. And this is what we need to understand. Not only is Jesus, our redeemer, our king, a gift from God, but our ability to have faith in him is also a gift from God. How many are glad the most generous being in the universe gives us the gift of salvation and the gift to believe in salvation? It's amazing. So maybe you're here and you're going, I don't know if I'm there yet. Just keep hanging around. It's amazing what God will do. Uh, Paul would talk about, about it this way in Ephesians 2. It is by grace you have been saved through faith. It's not of yourself. It's what? The gift of God. Only God can tr truly reveal who Jesus is. And only Jesus can truly reveal who God is. And there are people who get very upset about this. The exclusivity claims of Christianity. How can you say Jesus is the only way? You can learn religious laws and you can learn how the world works and you can learn how to behave morally, ethically, and professionally. You can learn all of those things through any world religion, but none of those world religions will actually lead you to God as your father and help you enter into a relationship with him. If all you want is just rules, any religion will do. But if you want a relationship with your heavenly father, there's someone who wants to introduce you to him today. That's what's true. So we come to know God through the work of Jesus. And we come to know Jesus through the work of God. And then he says this, I tell you that you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades or hell will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And then he ordered his disciples, what? Not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. Interesting. A church focuses on Jesus, but a church also lives out the mission of Jesus. And Jesus describes the church in really unusual terms. He says that the gates of hell will not be able to prevail against the advancement of the church. And most of us don't think about the church like this. Most of us think about the church as we're the gated community. We're kind of huddled up and holding out and hoping we can get through the challenges, the stresses, the tribulation, the temptations that we all face in everyday life, and that somehow we will make it until the end. That that's how we, so we see ourselves as being in the community that is being assaulted and the gates. Jesus did not say, and the gates of the church will prevail against the, the assault of hell. It's not what he says. He says the gates of hell now, gates in the ancient world had a very different uh, view than the way we think about them today. Gates in the ancient world were very important around city structures because what they would do is they could inhibit entrance or exit. When you close the gates, no one could get in or no one could get out. And it was also the place, like we have town halls and and, and uh, legislative buildings and things like that. But in the ancient world, the gates were the place where the leaders of the town would gather and they would organize their strategies for what they were going to do. How would they defend themselves? How would they develop land and, pr and produce fruit on it? Uh, what would they build? Uh, how would they use their resources? That's where all that strategy took place was at the city gates. And what Jesus is saying is, is that there's a kingdom and the kingdom is run by a dark power. He refers to it as, as the kingdom of, of hell, which is, is, it's a picture of Satan's kingdom. It's also a picture of a place where there's, there's just death. And, and he's saying that that kingdom has gates and that there are precious people who are being held captive behind those gates. And that part of the responsibility of the church is to keep assaulting those gates. We are an invasion force on a rescue mission. And we keep assaulting the gates of hell until people are liberated, set free, and they're able to come out into the world that God intended them to be able to live in. It's a really powerful way to think about the church. I'm going to ask uh, the worship team to come out. But... People, an example of, of people living in hell's gates, people who are hopeless. They, they look at their lives, they can't think of a single reason why anything would ever get better. People who struggle with addiction, they're bound to things and, and, and the only way they feel better 
is if they, they connect to those things. Or, or people who struggle with confusion, they, they have trouble with decision making, they, they have opportunities, but their life is exactly the same as if they had no opportunities at all because they're afraid to take advantage of them. Or people who live in fear, constantly driven by anxiety. anxiety. Or people who live in loneliness. And in those communities, in places like that when we live, our souls are drained and our hearts get dark. And, and, and hell likes to shut those gates. And here's the thing about hell. We, we, people still use that word today. How many have noticed? Rarely in a complimentary way. It's cold as hell. It's hot as hell. They gave me hell. I went through hell. Every once in a while, they use it as a compliment. That was a hell of a thing you did. And I know right now you're saying, I can't believe he's saying hell that many times. <laughs> Lent's not even over. What's he doing? Because Jesus sees all the people who are living in places where there's nothing but death looking in front of them death of relationships, death of hope, death of friendships, death of a future, death of goals, death of dreams, death of everything. That's all they can see out in front of them. And Jesus says that when we come and when we pray for people and when we share our faith with people, when we praise God, in our communities of faith, when we dare to hope that there's something better than what we have seen so far or anything that we see on whatever side screen that we're looking at, when we do those things, we are assaulting the very gates of hell. And with every prayer and every share and every single care action that we take, it begins to pummel the gates of hell until we ransack the communities where death reigns and life is brought to them again. Amen? Amen. Let's all stand to our feet this morning.